So I wanted to talk a little bit about The Irishman, uh, in part a review, and in other part kind of an Oscar chances type video, because when it comes to reviewing this film, there is less to say about it than most would think. Um, I wanted to rewatch it before I made this video, uh, but, you know, rewatching this movie is no simple and easy task. You have to allocate, like, literally a four-hour chunk of your life where you have nothing to do and you can just sit down and watch it. I don't want to watch it in chunks. I don't want to watch it like a miniseries. I, I want to watch it like Scorsese intended, which is why I, I saw it in the theater like a week or two ago. Um, so I'm going to, you know, I'll do a little bit of review, but it's almost shocking to me how little I have to say about it in terms of quality. Um, I think I could probably get a little more analytical after a second watch, but it's it's great. I mean, it's it's everything you would expect out of a Scorsese movie in terms of style and craft because it's put together incredibly well. It's enthralling from start to finish despite its runtime and it follows the great gangster type style that Scorsese has set for himself and that makes it really fun and entertaining and almost in a sense a great callback to what he used to make, to Casino and Goodfellas, because he hasn't made a movie like that in a while. I mean, he's, you know, still making great stuff, but when you compare this to Silence, they're, they're pretty vastly different films. Um, but that's not to say that it doesn't have any modernization of Scorsese, because this is, in a sense almost like something he's he's never made. Not only is he pairing with Netflix, but he is using modern-day technologies that a lot of us wouldn't have expected Scorsese to use. I mean, you've got a lot going on here that people wouldn't expect a filmmaker like this to um, tailor himself to, like digital re-aging or working with a streaming company, because a while back he was relatively outspoken on never doing that. And so people are kind of forgetting that this is an event in filmmaking, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit, but, like, if you're a film fan, you got to see this movie. It's a huge deal to any and all film lovers and filmmakers, and it's, I think, going to be a pretty big piece of history. Um, when it comes to the actual quality of the film, like I said, I, I think it's really, really well done. Um, this, I think a lot of people want to discuss the length of the film, and it reminded me a lot of Roma, which, despite being long, uh, is a lot shorter than this movie. I think like a full hour shorter than this movie. Um, there aren't many widely popular and successful three-hour-long films, or three-and-a-half-hour-long films. You have Endgame, recently. You have Titanic, back in 1997. Avatar, which is like 240, I think, and then like Dark Knight Rises and Interstellar, the two Chris Nolan movies that push three hours. Um, but this is this is one, and it's one that people are devoting themselves to going into theaters to see. And, and when you go into a three and a half hour long movie, you want to know, am I going to fall asleep? Am I going to enjoy myself the entire time? Should it be three and a half hours? And I think the answer to the question, should it be, is yes. It's, it's difficult to find places to pick out and remove because everything, I mean, it's a, it's, it's linear while being non-linear. Like, you feel everything build with characters, and you feel the relationships grow very naturally because everything is given the right amount of time to be fleshed out. But the story is told non-linearly. You're jumping back and forth, which I also thought was a very strong choice. Um, Scorsese is clearly passionate about this film. Um, I thought something like Silence, like I brought up early, was also... Um, a definitive passion project for him, and you could tell by how meticulously the film was put together, but you can also tell how much fun I think he had making this movie, because there is a lot of fun to it. There are um, a lot of comedic moments and um, creative elements. There's something they do with uh, lower thirds and title cards for characters that almost kind of like leads to just a couple of punchlines and are just made to be funny and I thought that shit was absolutely hilarious. I'm sure that was partially the script writing and always the, the genius editing work of Thelma Schumacher, but uh, like that kind of stuff you can tell he's really enjoying making this film and there's a clear and distinct vision for the movie. It's a three and a half hour long movie and you can tell he's got something in mind for every shot. And that's a really important thing to do when you're making a movie that you want people to be invested in for so long. Um, you have Steve Zalian tackling the script 
and he's a great writer, he's done really great stuff, and I think he uh, especially did a really, really good job with characters and defining characters. You get a really, really, really good sense of who everyone is. It's done very naturally, and it's not shoved down your throat. Like, that's that's where kind of the idea of every scene is important and pivotal comes into play. Not just with the relationships between characters, but also in developing the individual characters and giving them a sense of personality. Um, Despite all of these guys being mob-connected and murderers, in a sense, you like them. They're connectable, they're relatable, they're interesting, and they're layered. And they're the protagonists of the film, and you find yourself liking them. They're all kind of charming. And a lot of that also comes from the performances, which is a big talk with this movie. That's, I mean, that's half of the talk, right? You've got De Niro back with Scorsese, you've got De Niro back with Pacino, and you've got Pesci out of retirement working with De Niro again. And not only do they all put on, like, some of their best performances in years, but I think what's interesting about all three of them is, as actors and personalities in Hollywood, they're all such distinct people. Inherently, what they're known for is taking control of scenes. And, like, De Niro, you, th you, you have very specific things when you think of his face, you know, his voice. And you've got Pacino, and he's always the voice. And you've got Pesci, who is always the voice. And, like, scene-stealing performances. And it, it, oftentimes, when you watch movies, it's difficult to lose Robert De Niro in a character. It's difficult to lose... Al Pacino in a character, and Joe Pesci in a character, and all three of them disappear in this movie, somehow. I think it's because they cared so much about this movie, and they had such strong writing and direction when it came to this movie, um, and you're transfixed by these performances. I, I thought all three of them were fucking brilliant, and... Uh, even the, the supporting cast that some, like, Anna Paquin and Harvey Keitel have, like, three lines each, and they're fucking both great. What they can do with their facial expressions and the little nuances they put in, they're fucking great. Um, you've got Jesse Plemons, who I thought did a great job. You have Bobby Cannavale, who I thought did a great job. Uh, Ray Romano, who I thought did a great job. And they're barely in the fucking thing. They've got a couple of lines here and there, and they still make for distinguished characters that put something in the plot forward or give character a little bit more motivation or just a little bit more dynamic to why they're doing what they're doing and how that affects them in every step of the way. And that all plays into a three and a half hour runtime. Like I said, it reminds me a lot of Roma because... The first hour is tough, <laughs> and anyone who says the first hour is not tough is probably lying to you. You you find yourself kind of shifting in your seat a lot, and you're like, holy fuck, this is going to be a three and a half hour long movie. It's the same thing with Roma, where the first hour is very slow, both of these movies are very slow burns, but it grows on you. And not only as the movie continues, but when you get out of the movie. It, it, it grows on you, and you're liking it more and more, and you think about it more and more, and you're realizing that all those pieces were pivotal to everything that ends up building out. Um, and that's sort of the genius of the film. And I thought also, like, the last hour of this movie is a fucking masterpiece. I think, I think the last hour of this movie is absolutely perfect filmmaking. But when you make a slow burn film, that's the goal is something that grows on you. You're not necessarily, like, all the way there for the first couple hours. You have to wait. You have to be patient. And I think Scorsese does a better job than most when it comes to slow burn films because the first hour is a lot of De Niro narration and a lot of fun character introductions that are very reminiscent of Goodfellas. But it's also one of Scorsese's most grounded and humane films. There is a lot of emotional stuff in this movie and a lot of really powerful moments that come across through performances and writing and direction. And, you know, you always have this great style that comes out, the Scorsese mobster style that's almost indescribable in words, but you can always see it visually and, and hear it uh, through the music and, you know, these great other editing tricks that pop up. But it's still, like, when it wants to slow down and it wants to hit you in all the right ways, it does that. It manages to do that correctly. And 
it makes for a really powerful and impactful watch. I haven't seen it in a, about a week and a half, two weeks, and like I said, with that growing on you thing, as I'm talking about it right now, I'm loving it more and more. I'm, I'm loving the thought of the movie more and more, and it's a movie I want to go back and watch. It's difficult to make characters like what they're conveying charming, and I think they managed to do all of that. I would, I would give this movie an 8 or 9 out of 10 on my first watch, and I think that that could definitely be something that grows or elevates upon a second or third watch, because it's a movie I will absolutely watch again before award season, um, and I kind of want to just transfer into that more a little bit now because there's so much to talk about when it comes to the chances for this movie. Um, you're, you're looking at a film that's projected to be a front runner in categories almost all across the board, whether it's a front runner to win or like almost just a lock to be nominated. And there's a lot of interesting topics centering around this film. I said earlier I was going to talk about how this was an event in filmmaking, and it, it is because of, you know, it being a... a a Scorsese call, but I mean, Scorsese is one of the best filmmakers ever. Uh, he's created some of the best movies ever, and, I, you know, naming a flop of his is an incredibly difficult thing to do. Um, many of the films that he's made have had an impact on cinema as a whole, and then some of the ones that haven't had, like, this crazy impact, like King of Comedy, are amazing films. They're all exceptionally well put together. He, he picks and chooses his movies very carefully. He is, uh, a very big voice on film preservation. He cares a lot about cinema, and you can tell. So him making another movie is not just a big deal, but you have him working with the actor that started everything, right? Started this whole trend of Scorsese films. De Niro and Scorsese were the dream team in the 70s and the 80s and pushing into the 90s um, before DiCaprio came around in Scorsese's bench. Uh, and you have De Niro and Pacino working together again after Godfather and Heat. And, like, they are two... Like, other than Jack Nicholson, I would say, uh, in terms of living actors, they are two of... The, the actors with the most gravitas that are working right now that can just power a scene and power a film just with the two of them, right? And, and it's nice seeing them being in something great again. And the two of them working together as some of the biggest names in film is a huge deal. You have Joe Pesci coming out of retirement to be in this film and working with De Niro and Scorsese again. And, you know, you have one of De Niro's Oscars is from Scorsese and Pesci's Oscar is from Scorsese. I mean, it's a huge, it's a huge thing for lovers of film and, and no one can deny that. So that's already calling attention to the Academy voters. What is interesting is the lack of success Scorsese himself has had in winning Oscars. He's got his Best Director win for The Departed, and that was his first ever Best Director win, and you had that taken picture. Um, Raging Bull was very successful, but like Wolf of Wall Street didn't wind up winning anything, and um, Silence was very absent, but this is going to be one that's very difficult to ignore. I mean, like, again, you have a lot of performances across uh, Scorsese's career that have, have picked up Oscars, including Pesci and De Niro. Um, but I, I, you know, I think this one might go across against the trend and be one that the Academy can't ignore. Um, people are also going to talk about the Marvel controversy. Uh, that's been a big topic of discussion that I have said nothing on, and uh, you know, I'm not the biggest Marvel fan in the world, but I have maybe an unpopular opinion that this Marvel controversy helps Scorsese far more than it hurts him. Um, look, inherently, I think Marvel threatens everything that the Academy is about. The movies that the Oscars give Best Picture, in terms of box office numbers, fall far, far against the numbers that these Marvel films are making, and will probably continue to make. We'll see how this next phase does. I'm not gonna fucking talk about that right now. But I think that like something like Marvel is a threat to the Academy, and, and what they are all about in terms of awarding artistic films and the best films, which, you know, Marvel movies very often are not. And I think someone like Scorsese, who is a powerhouse filmmaker, standing against Marvel, you know, maybe the question was fished, maybe he's, maybe that's not entirely what he believes, there's been a lot more clarity to the question, and then you had Coppola come on and all that shit. But 
you can kind of tell by the Academy's history that they're not entirely pro-Marvel. Yes, you had Black Panther nominated everywhere. I have my opinions on that. I'm very outspoken on that movie. And, you know, that was going to be in Best Picture one way or a fucking another. But its absence in director and screenplay and fucking visual effects. I mean, you're talking about Marvel movies that the, the number one easiest award they should win the easiest thing they should win is visual effects. Not one Marvel movie has ever won Best Visual Effects. They continue and continue to lose. And they'll probably lose again this year. And I think that the Academy has somewhat of a distaste towards Marvel. And I think someone like Martin Scorsese standing against them is going to be something they recognize and almost want to reward him for. I think Scorsese is a sure bet for director. And I think Steve Zalian is growing to be a sure bet for screenplay. Uh, he has four nominations across his career and one win, and they're all very spaced out. Like, they're all, I think the first one was three years apart, and then it was like ten years apart, and then another, I think like seven years apart, and that was Moneyball, which like, he, he wrote, but didn't. <laughs> like, Sorkin just liked his script enough his original draft and was like, no, nominate him because, like, if, if you're gonna fucking, or not nominate, um, if I'm rewriting the script, you're crediting Steve Zalian because I like his script a lot. But he's still a fantastic writer and he's a favorite with Academy voters. He won for Schindler's List and it's been eight years since his last nomination, so he's due again and I think he'll probably win again. I think this is a good original screenplay bet. And I find it difficult to have a movie winning Best Director and Best Original Screenplay that will not win Best Picture. I've always found screenplay to be a little bit more of a precursor to picture than director, but it can kind of go both ways. Like Shape of Water was a director win, but then Green Book was a screenplay win. But when you have both, it's hard to lose. Uh, and I think this movie is going to have both. Uh, it just won the National Board of Review, Best Film, as well as Adapted Screenplay. Um, did I say Original Screenplay, by the way? I'm sorry, I correct myself before you go comment. It is an Adapted Screenplay. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. Um, but uh, it, Steve Zalian just won at the National Board of Review, and it, it just continues to pick up more and more traction. I think it had kind of the perfect release hit. Um, where it was opening at film festivals. It opened at just the right film festivals. It opened New York, I believe, um, and that was a good like point in the release date spectrum, and then it kind of hit limited where I was able to see it, and then it hit Netflix, and it's hitting wide, and the Golden Globe nominations come out next week where I'm assuming it's going to be spread out all over the place. Um, people are talking about the up-and-coming potential marriage story, which I agree with. It just like swept the Gotham Awards almost, and... Um, you know, I think it's going to continue to do well. I think it'll be a big Spirit Award favorite. But as of right now, I, I definitely see The Irishman as being a big Best Picture contender. I think all three of the primary performances will be nominated. De Niro will definitely be in lead actor. Um, I'm not going to talk about Category Fraud right now. I got tweeted about that a couple times recently, and I might make a video on Category Fraud. I just don't want to talk about it too much in this video in particular. But... Uh, I believe Pesci to be supporting actor, and I think the, the case could definitely be made that Pacino is a co-lead. But having seen the film, I think both of them will be in the category. Uh, it's been an exceptionally long time since Al Pacino has been nominated. At least De Niro's got the Silver Lining Playbook uh, supporting actor nomination in his back pocket from 2012, I think. or tw I mean, he was nominated in 2013, but the movie came out in 2012. Um, Pacino's last nomination was Scent of a Woman, which was his win back in, I think, 94. And then you've got Pesci, obviously, coming out of retirement is a huge deal. It's a big deal. And, I, you know, some people might decide to say it's not. It is. And he's an Oscar winner who went away for years, and he's back. And I think he's going to find himself in supporting actor. The last time there were two uh, people from the same film nominated for uh, supporting actor was Three Billboards, if I'm not mistaken, Rockwell and Harrelson, and I think um, that like shows that it's still capable of happening in recent Academy history, but I find all three of them will be in there. I think you're looking at a film editing nomination, a production design nomination, fuck, even a visual effects nomination. I'll briefly say I thought the de-aging uh, worked. The very first shot, I was like, oh shit, it's when he's driving the truck, and I went, uh-oh, 
it's not going to look good. And for whatever reason, it's just when he's driving that truck. And after that, it's like fine. Um, but I think they're going to respect the de-aging and can throw out a visual effects nomination. They love the low-key visual effects. Like I said, no Marvel movie has ever won Best Visual Effects. They give it to shit like First Man and Ex Machina. Uh, and look, I, I think you're looking at stuff all across the board. And I think it's just going to keep propelling it upwards and upwards. And maybe something will change. I'm looking forward to seeing the Globe nominations and seeing who shows up there. But, you know, if this thing wins picture drama, which I think it definitely has the ability to at the Golden Globes, I think that's a huge step for it. And I think it's just going to keep growing and growing. But that's it for this video. Uh, I went on a lot longer than I expected. I kind of thought this video was going to be short. But once I started talking, I just kind of kept going. There's not going to be a lot of cuts in this video. Um... Thank you guys for watching. Uh, I will be doing a Golden Globes nominations reaction live stream on Monday. Um, so long as I can get my laptop camera fixed, which is broken. I'm trying a couple of things. In worst case, I have an appointment with Apple coming up. Uh, so it should be good to go. Uh, worst case scenario, it'll be a video. And then um, my Oscar nomination predictions will be coming soon. Um, I, I feel almost ready to do those. I just have a couple movies left to see. Uh, I want to see Little Women in 1917 first, um, which I have not had the ability to see yet, but I plan on seeing those soon. Maybe Bombshell, too. I might wait for Bombshell. I think I'll get that next week. But other than that, um, thank you guys so much for watching. Let me know what you thought of the movie and its Oscar chances in the comments below, and I'll see you guys next time.